I worked myself up, so I was a president of a company and running a company. But I worked myself up. You know, I had been a secretary. I had been an accounting clerk. I had, I did all those things. So I knew how it worked. I knew how it functioned. And so I think all that. So it wasn't as though um, it was my journey through life. I think that prepared me to do what I'm doing now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan. I'm your host, Cliff Duvinois. It pleases me to no end when I see a group of people that are working very hard to bring a community back. And one of the communities that has just absolutely just been going through an absolute renaissance is Saginaw, Michigan. And I'm actually got the honor and the privilege today to speak to one of those people who are working hard to make Saginaw a place that People want to come. They want to bring their kids and they just want to hang out with all kinds of activities going on. With that, I am speaking with Nancy Parker. She is the executive director of the Saginaw Children's Zoo. Nancy, how are you? I'm doing great. Excellent. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Glad to be here. Why don't you tell us, tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up? I grew up right here in the area. I grew up in Carleton. I uh, graduated from Carleton High School. Nice. Right around the corner. Yes. And then after you got out of high school, you went to college? Uh, I went to several colleges, actually. Um, I moved out of the area. I moved to Ohio, and I was married at the time. My husband was transferred. And so I went to a couple different schools. Um, I went to Indiana University at Fort Wayne, went to Northwestern University, and then ended up on the West Coast and, and graduated at Purdue. Not Purdue. Oh. Pepperdine. <laughs> okay. And what did you study when you were in college? Business. Now, what made you decide to study business? Always liked it. Um, got, I did different jobs in different companies. And I'm one of those people who likes to watch and see what happens. And so I watched people in all kinds of companies as I moved around. And I thought, I could do that. I could do that. And so I it just found a fondness for it, I guess. Now, you were talking before, you mentioned about you and your husband had moved around to a couple of different states. And I can imagine that it's probably this little curly path. Yes, it's exactly. Going from business, because yes. you're talking about business yes. to now moving into like nonprofit. Yes. So share with us, how did you, how did you get connected with the zoo in the first place? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, decided to move back to Saginaw. Uh, I had lost my father. My mother needed some help. And so I thought it makes sense to come back to Michigan. Always loved Michigan. And when I came back, it was, what would I do? Um, and so I thought I could translate my for-profit skills to a not-for-profit. And I um, worked with the Shaheen family, which is a wonderful family. It's done a lot of good in the in uh, the city of Saginaw and, and the county of Saginaw. Yes. And actually beyond Saginaw, um, they're a wonderful family. And I got introduced to uh, someone who said, the zoo job is open. And when um, I've been a nature lover my whole life, you know, um, I'd rather be sitting under a tree than in a five-star hotel. So that's just me. And so I thought, wow, I could go to the zoo. And uh, I came here in 2004 and have been here ever since. So, because I know we talked about, you know, talk about translating of your skills, but we're talking about the executive director mm -hmm. of a zoo. So you've gotten some experience. So why don't you talk with us about, you know, when you first learned about the job, what what made you think that you were qualified or what qualifications did you have that you thought this, that I would be a good fit for this? Mm -hmm. um, one is, is that I, I, a science lover and we're a lot about science and then, and, uh, businesses all have some very common threads, whether they're for profit or not for profit, you know, different functions, um, in that. And the one piece that I did not have was, um, to have a responsibility for fundraising. Uh, and that is very much connected with not-for-profits. And so that was a fast learning schedule. But on the other side of it, um, I had participated in fundraising 
being part of businesses because businesses typically work with not-for-profits. Certainly. So I saw fundraising from the other side of it. And then, you know, as I came here, was responsible for it. And when you, you, you apply for the job, mm-hmm. obviously you got the job because mm-hmm. I'm talking to you today. When you came in here, what were some of the things that making that transition from private to nonprofit, what were some of those like transitions that, that you encountered that you thought, okay, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge or how did you adapt yourself? Mm -hmm. One of the things in not-for-profits is that, um, you never have enough people, um, in, uh, when you're working for a for-profit business, you typically have more resources you have more access to resources and so in this job you really have to do everything from a to z it's just the way that not-for-profits work so for myself um i i didn't uh i worked myself up so i was a president of a company and running a company but i worked myself up you know, I had been a secretary. I had been an accounting clerk. I had, I did all those things. So I knew how it worked. I knew how it functioned. And so I think all that, so it wasn't as though, um, it was my journey through life, I think, that prepared me to do what I'm doing now. And so when you came to the zoo, what were some of the projects that you started? What were some of the initiatives that you brought here to try to, you know, to help out the zoo? Well, we were a zoo. Um, I need to tell you a little bit about the history of the zoo. The, Perfect. The zoo was, we're a very old zoo, 1929. And it was in the 80s, um, it was run by the city. And in the 80s, there was a group of community citizens that decided that they were going to um, take the zoo. They worked with the city to take the zoo over to have a management agreement to operate the zoo. And so it's really within that group of people that the zoo is here today. And, and when they took it over, they started to build things. And that's 30 years ago now. But they started to really build some new buildings. And all these buildings at the top end of the zoo, they're all new. And if you come in through our uh, admissions gate, all that was built by the people who who took the zoo over. So when I came in, all that work had been started, but there was still a lot of work to be done. It wasn't, and and I guess in the zoo, it's never done really. Um, But we had an area in the lower part of the zoo that was an old pond. And uh, the lower part of our zoo kind of walks around a circle with exhibits, but in the center of it was this, old concrete dilapidated pond so that was the first project that we tackled and we created a wetlands um we can walk around you can see it very very different and and that just brightened up the whole lower area of the zoo and they had uh started a uh, adopt a garden program before i came actually our horticultural committee started that program and so we have now all these beautiful gardens all along our walkways. And so there were many things that had been started that then we took those things and did more. And there were other things like that pond that was in really need of work that we created a wetlands. So that sounds absolutely beautiful. My question to you is, because you said that the zoo was started back in 1929. Yes. So of the people that put this together in your research, did you run across anybody who really explained why they felt that Saginaw should have a zoo? Point in time where um, the community was suffering. You know, it was kind of after the lumbering era and and the city leaders started to focus on culture. So they started the zoo. The Choral Society started, the symphony started, you know, all these things started in the community back in that time when the community was challenged. And the zoo was one of them. And it was uh, some land and it was native Michigan animals, really. 
You know, right. raccoons, bears, you know, fox. It was that type of thing. So then the original animals to the zoo were just local animals. Yes. Mm-hmm. Animals you'd find in in the woods. Yes. And for most people's backyards. <laughs> yes. Yes, right. You're depending on where you live. Yes. Yes, yes yeah. definitely. Okay. Yeah. That's really good. Okay. So you were talking before about expanding some of these areas doing a lot of work as far as the beautification goes. Now, over your, your tenure here and doing these, these, you know, what has been like the impact? Like, have you seen like attendance go up because of this? Have you seen more people coming and, you know, maybe traveling from out of state? What are the, what is the results that you've been seeing? Yes. Well, um, we really have right now about 110,000 people coming here. And we draw from about a 60-mile radius. Um, around our facility, and sometimes a little further than that. Um, but we we are too. People think of us just from April to October, and that's kind of our zoo season. But we're so much more than that. We're really a year-round facility, not just in taking care of animals, but also we do programming. And so in the wintertime, we do a program called Living Learning Lab, and that is third grade students coming at, into this room that we're in right now. Right. And, um, and, that, and they have a school, a day of school here at the zoo. And we find that the kids love that program because there's no one else in the zoo. So in third grade, where they learn inference and observation, they're going out into the zoo, and it's their zoo for the day. And so it's a really wonderful program. We've had it going now for, we've had 10 years of programming. Um, couldn't do it during the pandemic and that, but um, it's really a wonderful program. And we do a, a series of questions at the beginning so we know where the kids are starting because not all classes start at the same level. Sure. You know, they may be at different levels. And then we ask those same questions at the end. And so we know kind of, did they learn something while they were here? And also we know from those questions initially how to adjust or adapt our program so that we can really, our whole goal is to reach the children and for them to have a wonderful day at the zoo. So, so then if I understand correctly, you're basically open year round. Yes, not to visitors, but we do it in different ways. And okay. that's programming where the teachers actually schedule their class to come here. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. Yep, and it's it's formal programming. I noticed that when the zoo opened back in April time frame, that there was a lot of press coverage about the lines, <laughs> like everywhere. And I, that's the first time, that's when you and I first started talking. And I was like, you know what? That's a good sign. That bodes well. Because if nobody was there on opening day, that would be bad. So, you know, the lines were there. And even today, like, so you've been open now for a few months. And even today when I came in, there's just cars everywhere. There's a line at the, at the front gate next to the mm-hmm. polar bear. And this is, this is just incredible. Yes. Yes. Well, today is Drop Everything and Read. And that's an event that we do every year. And we love to partner with other community organizations. And that's the Reed organization that does that event. And so um, every child gets a free book. There's all kinds of activities going on in the zoo. So, yeah, we love it. We really don't like to be here by ourselves. We really much prefer <laughs> having uh, people. Our animals do, too. So. Nice. For our audience, we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. And when we come back, Nancy is going to share with us how to make the best of your visit to the Saginaw Children's Zoo. We'll see you after the break. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan. I'm your host, Cliff Duvenois. Today, we're talking with Nancy Parker, the executive director of the Saginaw Children's Zoo. Uh, Nancy, I got a question for you. When I came in here today and was hunting for a parking spot, the one thing that caught my eye coming in, of course, was like the carousel. Mm-hmm. I don't see very many carousels at zoo, but I'm actually kind of a fan of carousels. So why don't you talk to us about, you know, where that carousel come from? Mm-hmm. Well, the carousel this year is celebrating its 25th anniversary. And the carousel was built by a local community group, the Tri-City Woodcarvers. Nice. And the Tri-City Woodcarvers decided they wanted to build a carousel. And it was about at the same time that a community group was trying to revive the zoo. 
And so uh, the, it was decided to be placed here, and it's wonderful. It is all uh, carved. Hand carved? All, yes. All oh. the, We have um, horses, and we also have some carved benches. Um, it has carved running boards on it. Uh, there are only about 136 of these in the United States right now. So we feel very lucky that um, we have one at the zoo and that, uh, you know, a group from the community was willing to do it. And the community also helped the woodcarvers by donating funds to the carousel. So it's really quite a beautiful. We love our carousel. It is. And I think about just the number of kids that would just climb on that day after day after day. And the fact that they actually made it out of wood versus like stamping horses out of metal or something, you know, and painting them. So it would be, have that durability. Yes. Yes. Today, a lot of them are fiberglass. And so, um, but we can get you right on. (laughs) Oh, that would be funny. Uh, I have to look at my Instagram page for a photo if that actually happens. So wonderful. Yeah. You know, the zoos aren't just for little kids. You know, <laughs> big kids can have fun too. <laughs> no, I just remember as a kid, whenever we went to the fair, Cedar Point, someplace like that, it seemed like my always like, like my favorite ride was always a carousel. Yeah. I like roller coasters and things like that, but the carousel, there's just something that's just magical about it that I just really love. So that that's just pulling in the parking lot was just something that caught my eye. Let's talk about. Because you, before you were talking about some of the the programming around here that happens, like mm-hmm. when people think you're closed, but mm-hmm. you actually have events going on. So talk to us more about some of those events that you got coming up. Mm-hmm. Okay. All season long, um, and what you see here today is deer, um, and that's uh, an event. We have a variety of different events. Some events are uh, focused on conservation and that, so we'll have different activities in the zoo. Always there's a full list of those on our website, saginawzoo.com, and we go through our whole summer season. So there's activities and events. Then at, in October, we do kind of our big event that ends our regular zoo season, which is Zubu. And Zubu <laughs> is all about <laughs> Halloween in the zoo. So the zoo's all decorated, and uh, our employees dress up. And it's so fun. People love it. They come as families. And many times the family, they'll all be, the mom will be dressed up, the dad will be dressed up, and the kids, and they all dress in theme. And so it's just oh, how cute. very fun. And we do different activities around the zoo that are all Halloween themed. It's wonderful. We do that for three weekends in October. Beautiful. And if do you got what, what kind of programming do you have in the winter? Well, we do our education program called Living Learning Lab. And that is specifically target, targeted for third grade students. Sure. And so teachers sign up their class. Um, we have a number of different modules, and they just coordinate with us what day they want to come here. Bus brings them in the morning. They spend a day here of um, educational programming uh, with us and hop on their bus, go back to their school, and go home. We have five modules that uh, they can do. And they're all tied to things that children in Michigan need to learn in third grade. So we don't charge for that program currently. That's a free program. Teachers just have to enroll their class. Now, when you talk about like teachers bringing their students here, you got the classes that are going on. And obviously, part of the mission of the zoo is to educate people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we come and look at the animals, but we want to learn something about the animals that are here. Yes. So... Share with us a little bit about how you go about finding the staff that comes in here to be able to share this knowledge and to educate the public, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Well, many of our people are um, have science, science degrees, and so those are the individuals who are uh, knowledgeable about science and working with our animals and that, and also individuals who are doing teaching for us would really have, um, they would have a knowledge of teaching, but also science. So we're very much, uh, have a very big part of us that's a scientific part of caring for animals. And it's more complicated than what I ever knew before I came here. Certainly. Has it been hard? Because I know a lot of businesses talk about this, and I can imagine nonprofits getting impacted even more since COVID. Mm -hmm. Has it been hard to find staff to come in here and work? 
not, you know, we're always finding staff because we have a what we call a year-round staff. And those are people who work for us 12 months of the year. But when we open for the season and we have big days like today, we bring in high school, college students and all that, and we kind of ramp up. And so our workforce more than doubles in this time period. So it's always people coming and going um, in that way. And it's just something we're used to. And we pride ourselves in being a good place to work. And so many times we'll have it um, or a good place to be in general because we have a a youth volunteer program called Zoo Crew, and uh, you can volunteer for the zoo at age 13. So we'll have um, students that come and participate in that program, and then when they get to be 16 and they're in high school, they come to work here in the summer. Nice. And then they go away to college, and then they come back here and work for us in the summer. So many times, you know, we'll have someone who starts with us at 13 as a volunteer and then there until they graduate from college. So we may have a seven or eight year relationship with them. And that's what we really like. We really like to kind of bring people in and bring them along. And many times those um, zoo crew volunteers came here as children themselves. So their parents brought them here and then, and so it's wonderful. It's like we go through the whole life cycle, you know, it's great. That is cute. I could imagine like if, if a, a child had a dream of being a zoologist or a veterinarian yes. or something like yes. that, to yes. actually be able to come here and start to get that experience, yes. then be able to work here, you know, and then you go to class, you learn about it, yes. you know, at the university, and then you come back here and you, you kind of get to see it and apply. I could just imagine that's just golden. Yes. Yes. I, uh, many times in the community, I'll have someone ask me um, and say, oh, my son, daughter wants to be a veterinarian. And I say, tell him to come volunteer at the zoo. Just tell him to come around us because, you know, they they need to sort a lot of that out, what their likes and dislikes and all that. Sure. And there's nothing like being right here um, and seeing it first, firsthand. Yes, because the, you know, just just the, the minor brushing I've had with the pet industry this is huge mm-hmm. and it is growing fast yes. because a lot of people are very interested in the animals. You know, the environment is a very key issue and they're all the time looking for people to understand these things. So yes, I could definitely see how a child would definitely want to take advantage of this. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. It's wonderful. Let's talk about if, if I were to bring my family here, mm-hmm. And I've never been to the Saginaw Children's Zoo before. So I already know, you know, if I got little kids or, you know, let's just stick with little kids for now. So I've got little kids here. You know, I know there's going to be line stuff. What are some things that you would recommend parents to think about when they're planning their day? Like, hey, let's go to the zoo. What are some things that they should think about? Mm -hmm. Well, um, one thing I want to say, if you're coming in from another community, you could, because it, most people spend about two, two and a half hours here. So if you're coming to spend the day in Saginaw, there are lots of other wonderful things you can also do here. Okay. Okay. So that's one thing I would say. And um, and that, because we do have a wonderful children's museum, we've got a great historical museum, um, and that, so you could plan some other activities. The zoo's located in the kind of park area of Saginaw, the city of Saginaw. So you can bring a picnic and you could do more things like that. As you come to the zoo and you come into the zoo, we have a beautiful carousel and I wouldn't miss that. Um, I think you really have to just take a little look at it uh, further because it's really a work of art. Um, And part of the zoo, we have animals, we have all these wonderful gardens, but we have history too. Right. And so we have a couple of historical fountains and that. So I always say if, you know, even if you're not as much of an animal person, we have something here for you. And as far as like thinking about food, you know, thinking about water, talk to us about what it is that you offer here. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have a big construction project going on right now. 
And so we are redoing the area that is our food area and our whole food plaza, and that should be done this fall. So um, if you're coming this year, you will see that um, construction and project progress. And so we have now a little, um, it's a like a mini food truck kind of thing. And, nice. Um, and so we sell uh, hot dogs and chips and cheese and popcorn and drinks and uh, snacks and ice cream and that type of thing. So we're, we're not complicated on the food side. And we do allow um, people also to bring food in. So if you want to bring a picnic in and have a picnic here, you're more than welcome to do it. And w- one of the things that, cause, I, cause you said before that you could probably get through the zoo in about two and a half hours. What would be like maybe a few exhibits, two or three or whatever that you would say, you know, if I was coming in here, these would be like the three things I would recommend that you see. Obviously we want to see everything, mm-hmm. right? But here are three things that I really think you should see. So what would those be? Mm-hmm. Um, our wolves. We have Mexican, we have three Mexican gray wolves and um, they're in a beautiful exhibit and um, I would recommend, you know, um, because people don't get to see wolves up close. You know, we're a smaller zoo and so you really have a better view most times of our animals um, and that, and so I definitely wouldn't miss the the, um, wolves in the Forgotten Forest. Um, The other thing that we have that is unusual is that we have beehives at the zoo and you have some in areas that are not visitor areas but in the cabin that is right next to where the wolves are um, we have an active beehive and so you can actually see the bees the bee the, easy for me to say <laughs> the bees making honey in that and actually working in the hive and so that's something that you wouldn't really wouldn't see anywhere. So, so I'm curious, is this place just, is it giant windows in a building? Is it an all glass? It's a, it's a enclosure? hive that where the bees can go outside. Sure. Okay. And then you can actually look in and see all the bees working in it. So it's plexiglass on the front of it. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can see right into the hive. Excellent. Yeah, which you don't get to do. So I always think, what can we do that, you know, you, you don't get to do? Unique and fun. Sure. And you mentioned before about the construction going on, specifically around what I, I'll just call it the food court mm-hmm. uh, in that area there. Uh, is there other places in here where you're, you know, expanding, going to bring new exhibits in? Yes. We have a building. Um, we right now are working on, uh, we have three projects that we're working on. The first one is underway. The next one, there is a building where actually we're going to remodel that. As soon as this one is done, we'll start working on that. And that will have animals inside the building where you can actually go in and um, and that. And so that will be a really nice, uh, when the weather, maybe there's a little rain or it's a little warm, you know, you'll be able to get in there out of the heat or out of the, the sprinkles. Certainly. And the one question uh, that I would like to close with is, and this has been a recurring theme throughout this interview, and I want to take a minute just to explore it, because what you're doing here is not inside of a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about, oh, we're adding this building, oh, we're renovating this, right? This tells me that there's people from outside Mm -hmm. of the zoo that are coming in here to do this particular work. You've had, you talked before about these, uh, the, the gentlemen that carved Mm -hmm. or the wood carvers that carved Mm -hmm. the, you know, the carousel, things like that. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about working with the community to really make the zoo a special place. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do it without the community. Um, I'll give you an example. Last Friday, we had a water main break. Four o'clock. Oh, that must have been a nightmare. Four o'clock on Friday afternoon. Right before the weekend. And we have, uh, our zoo closes at five o'clock. So we left the leak until five. We turned the water off and we are calling in the community saying, we need help and we need it now. We had a crew here seven o'clock Saturday morning. And by, we open at 10 on Saturdays, by 9.52, our water was back. Beautiful. And 
that's really people helping the community. They knew what it meant to us, and it meant a lot. It meant a lot to, you know, the family that comes in and what does a child want to do first thing, right? They want to go into the restroom. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we had to make sure that we were taking care of our visitors. So our community really helps us do that. And our community, uh, the money that we're investing right now, we're putting in um, unisex bathroom. We're putting in a uh, new uh, nursing quiet room. Uh, we're doing all of that. And that's really from funds we raised from the community. And the other thing I would say about our community is as much as they give us, we work to give back. So we work with a lot of other not-for-profit groups that, that um, we'll do things for. And the money that we raise, because we raise $3 million to do this work, we really work to invest back into our region. So we prioritize those funds. Um, a few years back, we did the accessible train project where we actually uh, created a new car and did some improvements in that so that our train could be accessible for those people who had extra needs. When we did that, we invested 85% of the money that we raised for that project right back into our community. We could have gone to Kansas City and ordered things and had them shipped here, but we didn't. We really worked with the local blacksmith and the local irons. You know, we did all of that um, to really keep the money invested here. Nancy, if somebody's listening to this interview and they're like, you know what, I want to bring my family over there to the zoo and they want to check out what you're doing online and take a look, maybe look at the maps, the parking situation, whatever that might be. Where's the best place for them to find you online? SaginawZoo.com. Excellent. That is the place to go. That tells you what animals we have, that tells you our event schedule, uh, tells you, gives you everything you need to know uh, is on our website. And you can always call us. We still have someone answering the phone. A lot of more People do that? But we, we actually answer our phone. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Nancy, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. I've learned a lot today, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. And for our audience, you can always roll on over to TotalMichigan.com, click on Nancy's interview, and see all the links that she mentioned above. We'll see you next week with another inspiring story of a Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. See you then.